welcome back to the Bitter Betty podcast. I'm Bitter Betty Deadhead here with my two cohorts. Bitter Betty Tova. And Bitter Betty Carol with an E. Okay, we're good. All right, guys, we are back with uh, Chapter 6. Again, we are recording live. We are recording this live. Uh, so if you see us talking to the audience, that's what's going on. But we are back with Ren, Chapter 6. Um, Kelly T. warned us that this one was, we probably, me and Carol probably need to bring out the tissues for sure. But I yeah. don't have them. It's okay. I'll use my t-shirt. <laughs> Man, I uh, oh, I, I, dread I hope this. you don't make me cry. Like I don't, I don't like to cry, and I don't really cry. Like I don't know, it's just random. It's ran Like remember, cause it's so random. I never cry at anything, but then Paige made me cry with her song. Like yeah, you know, I yeah. I don't know. It just has to hit a chord. I emotions are broken. Sorry, guys. Well, if it's uh, anything to do with the S word about you know what Joe you know about Joe uh, yeah. and all that stuff, I'm gonna lose it. Yeah, I get emotional about stuff that I really, when I really understand the emotion. If I don't necessarily understand the emotion, it's hard for me to relate to it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know anybody who's committed suicide, but I can relate more to someone who's overdosed. I, I, you know I, what I mean? Like, I know a few so people just, who have, and um, so I do relate yeah. to that from Ren's standpoint on that. Mm -hmm. And then, like, just death in general. But if Ren cries, I'm crying. I'm just, just a heads yeah. up. Yeah, I'm more likely to cry if somebody else is crying for sure. Um, but also, like, because when Paige was talking about, she was talking about, like, you know, the feeling the feeling you have, like, I feel a lot of emotions in myself about, like, depression and, and things like that. So I relate to that stuff more. So the more I relate to something, the more it, uh, I can relate to the emotion. Maybe that's what it is, I guess. I don't know. I do right. feel it. I just don't always cry. Right. Let, let's break. Let's pull this Band-Aid off. Oh, okay, let's go. Hmm. Ren, why you do me this way? You can do me other ways, though. <laughs> he can do me oh, any way he wants to. My, my. <laughs> anyway. My. But I'm going to try and hold it together for uh, this one. Oh, Lord. Damn it, <laughs> Ren. Already? <laughs> this is going to be a long 20 something minutes. Oh, okay. 2015 was the worst year of my life. At the end of 2014, I attended a private UK-based ME specialist clinic called Breakspear. For some reason, the treatments had sent my health nosediving, and I became more sick than I'd ever been. I became so weak that I couldn't walk to the bathroom without needing to lie on the floor to recover. I couldn't focus on anything. I couldn't read. I couldn't watch TV. All I could do there hey was Kelly. lie there in pain. Hey Kelly. It was obvious Kelly, during this time that I needed to move back home with my mum again. She moved to Cardiff Just with a new time. husband and they had a spare room, which became my tomb for the next eight months. At this point, I was so weak that the most that I could manage to do a day was to take a shower. The rest of the time I was confined to my bed. I started reacting even more severely to foods, so every single meal had to be blended into soups or broths to avoid negative reactions. Pain constantly shot through my shin bones and through my feet, like splinters. No. My stomach would gurgle and the muscles in my body would constantly twitch, spasm and ache. My body felt drained of every single ounce of life and I was so tired, but I was too wired to sleep. I was so full of mental fog that reading a single page on a book seemed impossible. The daylight coming in from behind the curtain hurt my eyes. Loud sounds felt overwhelming. All I could do was wait and pray for sleep, knowing that when I woke from it, nothing would change. I wouldn't feel in any way rested and all the symptoms would persist. This went on and on and on. It was day after day of physical and mental torture. I thought of concentration camps, of prisoners of war being tortured. At least the escape of death seemed likely. During that time I never got breaks. My whole body burned, my brain was on fire and I had nowhere to hide. In the merciful moments where I could concentrate, I tenaciously trawled the internet, looking for ways out. Mm -hmm. My research drew me to a procedure called a fecal transplant that was having success managing things like Crohn's disease or colitis. It had also gained success in some select cases of autoimmune conditions like MS2. 
At the time, I felt like much of my issues were caused by dysbiosis, which means an imbalance in your gut flora. I noticed that all the food intolerances started after a large course of antibiotics for the parasite. I wondered if the parasite had wreaked, wreaked havoc on my microbiome before I nuked it with antibiotics that worsened it further. Fecal transplants can introduce a whole host of probiotic bacteria into your gut and it can re-establish a healthy homeostasis. A normal person speak, I wanted to pay to put another person's poop in my butthole. I carried on filming videos from my bed, blogging my experience. I was pretty convinced that during this time I wouldn't be alive much longer. And part of me wanted there to be some kind of document of what I'd been oh, through in right. hopes that it might help someone later mm-hmm. down the line. I remember that video. Look oh, at him. This does kill me. <laughs> then, that was I want this watch. video. Mm-hmm. I want somebody, some, somebody who can take notice of this video and, and do something with it. I had a fundraiser open to save money for the fecal transplant, which was very slowly creeping up. I needed to save 6,000 in total. I remember my girlfriend wanting to come and visit, but telling her that I didn't want her to. There are a few reasons for this. One, I was pretty sure I was going to die soon. The day before Joe died, I'd been sat with him at a pub, catching up, playing pool, cracking jokes. I'd often wondered if I'd have been hit less but hard by his death if I'd been away at university when it happened. For my girlfriend's sake, I wanted her to have distance from me. I also felt ugly. I felt unlovable. I was unable Mm. to communicate. And I didn't want her to see me like that. I watched my mum look thinner and more frail every day that she had to watch her son deteriorate. And I felt immense guilt. My mum would often walk in and find me either crying on the bathroom or kitchen floor, having no energy to get back into bed. She'd often sit with me and massage my feet, which always hurt. And she'd hum melodies Mm. to me, like she would do when I was a little boy. During this whole time, I hadn't picked up my guitar. I barely had any sunlight touch my skin, and I lost a lot of weight. I was about 130 pounds at my lowest, about eight or nine stone, which for someone who is six foot one is very skinny. My average rate is usually about 168 pounds, 12 stone. (laughs) Every day, the same thing. I'd wake up in pain, eat a meal of blended vegetables and chicken, lie with my eyes closed for hours while the world seemed to spin erratically, and I'd often cry as the bones of my legs felt like they wanted to grow out and burst out of my skin. Despite this, what I didn't know is things were about to get a lot worse. Come June- I'm sorry, y'all read Peter's comment real quick. Oh, wow. I saw that, yeah. I saw it. I've been in bed for about six months straight. I've regained some energy to leave the house every now and then to go shopping for groceries with my mum and I finally reached my target for the fecal transplant and my mum drove me to the clinic to get the procedure. Everything seemed to go as smoothly as it could for such a bizarre experience. I received a colonic irrigation, which was like a car wash for your colon. Actually feels pretty good. They then proceeded to put someone else's excrement in my behind. They would repeat this process for five consecutive days. When I got home, I realized I felt a little odd, almost manic, and I was hopeful that this meant my energy was coming back, but it wasn't a nice feeling. As the days progressed, I started to feel an innate sense that something was very wrong. It seemed my immune system was going into some sort of overdrive. My brain was buzzing, and the more time that passed, the more uncomfortable I felt. I remember early one morning, I was lying on the kitchen floor after attempting to get a glass of water. My body hurt so much that I was digging my nails into the laminate flooring, screaming, and my mum ran in and asked me what was wrong. I remember repeating, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, over and over again. I felt myself falling down a deep tunnel in my mind, almost as though my entire soul was tumbling down into an abyss. When I finally crashed to the bottom, I was hit with this immense feeling of stillness and peace. I stopped crying. I sat up. And my mother looked at me, puzzled. I have not felt to this day that sort of serenity that I felt in that moment. I looked around the room and everything seemed to have gained a clarity and quality. But what was most peculiar was the feeling of stillness. There seemed to be some sort of respite from the mental torture and fog in my brain. I still to this day have no explanation for what happened. I looked at my mum. I smiled at her calmly and I told her that everything was okay now. 
Her partner Michael came in and I remember them both looking at me, perplexed. I started speaking fluidly for the first time in months, but it wasn't quite me. I was cracking jokes, being witty. My mum would laugh nervously. I remember feeling as though I was coming up off an ecstasy pill. I felt this underlying feeling of euphoria. I caught myself occasionally erratically snapping my fingers or making whistling noises in between sentences <laughs> or staring at some empty part of the room as though there was somebody there then snapping back to the space and talking to my mum. This feeling of intense euphoria lasted about eight, 48 hours. During this time, I'd adopted some new strange behaviours. Everything in my room that wasn't parallel bothered me, so I had to make sure it was aligned and facing the same direction. The whistle and the finger click became a new tick and it started rising in frequency the more time that elapsed. I also noticed that I'd get stuck on words or sentences when talking to my mum. For example, if I was saying a sentence like, I'm not sure how I'm feeling today, I would sometimes get a stock on the whole sentence or just a word from it and repeat it about 30 or 40 times before I could move on to the next. So I'm not sure how I'm feeling today, feeling today, feeling today, 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 over and over. I can't really explain why, but it's like saying it carved out a safe space for me. After about two days, that feeling of peace and euphoria was swapped out for a feeling. Like this part is really hard for me. Yeah. Um, because of Riley. Yeah, um, I was thinking of Olivia. So um, I don't know if some of you guys don't know. So if some of you guys may not know, my daughter has Tourette's syndrome. So um, she does some of the, um, the, the weird ticks or clicks or whatever it is. And when he's talking about being stuck on a word, um, that's some of the things that she does. So um, she has physical tics. Her physical tics are usually jerking of the neck, chin, shoulder. Um, and then she gets she gets stuck. And um, like if she's trying to talk or she'll say, you know, I'm having a hard time today with tics. And then she'll just, when she goes to say it, she'll say, I'm having a hard time with tic, 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 tic. Like it's not stutters, right? But it's like mm -hmm. they're stuck like, on this repeat. Mm -hmm. right it's different than like an actual stutter um yeah. so yeah that it, it can be kind of rough so this one's mm -hmm. like this is really hard for me to listen to him talk about being stuck on those words you know because at first when it started happening with my daughter we weren't sure what the hell was happening right i'm like i, I don't understand what the heck is happening See, so Olivia's and autism, she, she has different too. tics so yeah yeah the autism yeah. does it too yeah because um, it's all related right mm -hmm. it's all related yeah, yeah, Olivia, mm. she'll get stuck on something, and <laughs> but see, like, the way he explained it about like it felt, it felt like he had to get it out, like it was um, it was like a comfort thing, you know, to get it out. Um, that's the way Olivia is, and we have to just let her go through the process of it. We can't tell her to stop or nothing like that. We have to just let her get it out. So I, I get yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Because we, ha we haven't been interrupting them much, but I, that one what, just... What, what was that? Just got me. I don't know. It was in my house. It was. Like, did somebody say it was in my ass? I'm sorry. That was me. Wait, wait. What did you say? Uh, something was, there was something in my... It was like, I don't know if it was like a spider or not. In your ass? There was something crawling <laughs> in my pants. And, all, and I was like, I have an idea. <laughs> Luckily, I got it out, but I just decided to walk out and say, It's in my ass! It's in my ass! Okay. We okay. heard it. We trust me. Everybody heard it. Well, I heard from it in the other room. <laughs> so I was like, I heard what the hell too. was that? <laughs> I was like, yeah, huh? Do, tell what him to do me a favor. Go so wash his right. hands now. <laughs> Carol said, "Go wash your hands now." <laughs> that is hilarious. He's a clean freak. I'm I sure he's already even, done it. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, I'm so glad I wasn't crazy just then. I really thought I was hearing shit. I was like. No, he really said Red, that. Red, is that you? <laughs> well, I, I'm glad it's not. Go, uh -huh. please. I'm glad. I'm glad um, that we were paused during all that. Like that's hilarious. It's still okay. Video. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but still, oh that'll make a great. That, I can't. That's great. <laughs> all right. All right. I can't. Oh dread God. and doom. I felt fear fill my body, unlike any fear that I've ever felt. 
I'd often wake up in the early hours of the morning screaming at the top of my lungs. A torture wrist screen that would fill the whole house. A scream like my legs were being sawn off. I felt pure terror. My mum would run in and try and calm me down. Sometimes I'd be thrashing, hitting the mattress, pounding the walls. It usually ended up in me exhausting myself and her stroking my head in her lap as I sobbed and repeated the same oh. words over and over again. Everything in these moments terrified me. The compulsion to make everything par parallel became a necessity. Whenever I was in the kitchen or car and the dials were facing the wrong way, it taunted me. My mum started taking me to a weekly talk therapist in hopes it would stop me from killing myself. I did catch myself researching the most painless ways to do it. I often daydreamed, I often daydreamed about death and it made me feel at peace. At this point, oh. intense paranoid delusions started creeping in. I wondered if what was happening to me was demonic. I don't remember how I got there, but I remember one time speaking on the landline to someone who claimed to be an expert yeah, in dark Robert. magic. He told me that being around my mum was bad for me. He told me that she was bad. He told me that I needed to do a ritual with black wax candles in order to free myself. I remember ordering black candles from eBay and when they arrived, I had a change of heart and I decided against doing the dark, this dark magic ritual. I fell asleep that night and I woke up the next day to find the t candles totally melted onto the white mantelpiece that they were on. They'd never been lit. I st still don't really know for certain if anything of these things happened, but the melted wax was definitely real. I remember picking it off with my nails. There were moments that my rational mind knew that I was hallucinating. Sometimes in the night I would hear perfect string quartet symphonies with no sound source for them to be coming from. I remember one time my mum took me with her to the post office because during this time I'd rarely been left in the house alone. I remember the lady behind the till reaching for some sellotape. As she tugged on the tape it sounded as though it had been amplified a thousand times. It was definitely loud. I ran out of the store crying and shaking and I sat in the passenger seat of my mum's car rocking back and forth where she found me uncontrollably sobbing repeating the words I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't over and over again my paranoia grew I boomeranged between thinking I may have been latched onto by some demonic entity and I became suspicious of even my own family to thinking I might, might be part of some sort of twisted experiment where a group of observers were seeing how far they could push me before I snapped and shattered. My irrational mind concluded that if I start behaving in unexpected ways, I might confuse the people conducting this experiment and they'd shut it down. I'd sit in my own bed manically grinning in response to the jolt of pain in my legs. I'd say things to mum and Michael which made no sense at all. This all seemed to be leading up to a very unusual day. I can't quite recall the details of how it happened because it was quite tricky to tell what was reality and what was not. But from what I remember, I was in a car with my mum parked outside a supermarket and I'd put my laptop on the roof of the car while I'd helped her with groceries. I'd forgotten it was there and she drove off. It wasn't until about an hour later I noticed and I started panicking. My laptop had on it hundreds of songs from my time in Brighton. It was all I had really to show for my life. I was already in such an emotionally fragile space that losing that felt like some sick, torturous joke. We drove back and searched every place it could be with no luck. As we were driving home, my mum pulled up at a junction and something in me snapped. I got out of the car and I ran away from it. I convinced myself this was still part of the experiment because what else could explain that sort of luck? Once I got far enough away, I proceeded to strip off all my clothes and I lay in the middle of a road staring up at the sky, laughing in hysterics. This was the opposite of how one should react to losing their computer and so it seemed like the perfect way to conv confuse my observers. With time, the police showed up as did my mother. By some miracle, she convinced them not to take me in or section me. And by a further miracle, they also relayed to my mum that a dented laptop had been handed in an hour earlier. I took this as meaning my experiment had worked. I eventually snuck off as my mum was talking to them. I wandered slowly around this unfamiliar village until I encountered the second angel I would meet in my life, this time in the form of a black homeless man. I'm not sure how we got there, but I was, as I was walking, I turned to my side and a man dressed in tattered grey clothes was walking beside me. He asked me what was wrong, and I explained the best I could the events of the day. I explained that I'd been sick a very long time, that I was tired, so tired, and that I just wanted to be better. The homeless man paused. He put his hand on my shoulders, 
and he stared into my eyes. His eyes had a light grey tint. They were almost white. And something about his presence made me feel incredibly safe. Incredibly still. He smiled. A kind smile. And he said to me, Everything's going to be okay, Ren. And then he vanished. I hadn't told him my name. I never hallucinated anything after that day. I have no real explanation for that day. I chalk it down to a psychotic episode or stress-induced hallucination. But the events which follow put a lot of questions in my mind. What he said to me was very simple, but also very needed. I realise a lot of people might hear these stories and just presume I'm a bit mad, a bit weird, like I do when people tell me their ghost stories. All I can do is tell you my experience and let you derive your own conclusions from it. Anyway, I got home and I started to obsessively research ways to escape this new seemingly psychotic space I was in. It's a strange thing to describe, but it was like me, Ren, was in the passenger seat of my mind while some other entity was steering the ship. I was watching myself do things like scream at night or repeat words over and over, and I think to myself, damn, that's pretty crazy. But I wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Every now and then I had moments of lucidity where I was more in control. I was doing things like stimming, I had night terrors, vocal tics, I'd stutter and I'd stammer. And for, for me, a lot of that lined up with some sort of transitory or stress-induced autism. I'd known a family with an autistic teenager and some of the behavior seemed to line up, which led me to a new pathway of online research. I came across this support group for a subset of children with autism called PANDAS, P-A-N-D-A-S. It was believed that these kids had the neurological infection of the streptococcus bacteria that was causing these autistic-like behaviors. I was presenting with some sim similar behaviours. These kids would do long courses of antibiotics and their symptoms would diminish or disappear and they'd be seemingly normal children again. I speculated that the faecal transplant introduced a whole host of new bacteria into my gut but that I didn't have the immune regulation to be able to control it and it had sent my entire system into some sort of inflammation overdrive. I researched the most effective antibiotic for streptococcus, one being penicillin, and I convinced my mum to take me to the doctor where I faked a stomach bug. I lied to him and I said I'd had similar things in the past and the penicillin cleared it right up. He reluctantly prescribed me a two week course of antibiotics because I was so persistent. I got home and I started the course. Initially I felt fucking awful, somehow even more tired than usual. And then towards the end of the course, I noticed a definite shift in my energy and comfort. By the end of the course, my psychotic behaviors had disappeared and my energy felt a lot better. I stayed indefinitely on various herbal an antibiotic supplements like oregano oil at this time, having learned that this was also active against certain pathogenic bacteri bacteria. Keep in mind also, I'm just going off script right now. Keep in mind if I had followed, if I'd have followed the advice of mo most of the doctors that I'd seen at the time who were talking to me about my psychotic behaviors, I would have probably been put into a mental facility and medicated with medication uh, that I didn't need and would have probably gotten a lot worse. So it was very lucky that I took the, anti like no one tells you that antibiotics can treat psychosis and these antibiotics did in actually treat my psychosis. And I was no stranger to the placebo effect. I'd taken everything, it wasn't placebo. It didn't matter. Uh -huh. After a week, after about a week, I'd finished the course and some of my more familiar symptoms like fatigue and pain started creeping back again. But that didn't matter because what this whole experience had taught me was that the origin of my sickness was in fact bacterial and it was pathogenic. The biggest thing it taught me was I could actually do something about it. I was no stranger to the placebo effect after years of trialing different drugs and supplements. This wasn't placebo. I took to the internet again and found a world-renowned specialist over in Brussels who was also leading a lot of the cutting-edge research for Emmy. I got on the phone and made an appointment. He was booked up for the next nine months, but that gave me enough time to save money. The antibiotics and new herbs I was taking had also given me a new lease of life, and the hope for a cure made me more determined than ever. I started having enough energy to go on walks, which was huge for me at the time. My dad would drive over to my mum's and we'd go out in the car, and I'd take photos of wildlife on beaches. I was picking up my guitar again after months in bed. I eventually invited my girlfriend over and made the decision to move back to Brighton as soon as I was strong enough to.
It was around this time that I started working on the album Freckled Angels. I knew that the future tests weren't going to be cheap. I pulled together some old tracks from the days I was working with Sony and I got hold of Eric and asked his permission to release them, which he graciously granted. So thank you, Eric. I then pulled together some newer material and compiled my first ever album from my bedroom. In those days, I had no real way of promoting myself and no energy to do shows, so it was mostly to be listened to by my friends and family. I named the album Freckled Angels after Joe. Joe was covered head to toe in freckles, and it seemed fitting to dedicate this work to one of the coolest and funniest people I ever knew. Any ounce of energy I did have from my limited re reserves, I'd pour into recording that album. It's by no means a work of art, and it's a bit thematically disjointed, but some songs like Crutch or Pocket Full of Pain went a long way to photographing that time. I'ma leave you with a recording of Pocket Full of Pain. Back in those days, enjoy. I watch the sun when it rise, when it's climbing the sky I sit here with the pocket full of pain I've got tears in my juice, in my mind There's a noose, but my hope makes me cling to the day I wanna run with the sun and the moon and the stars Till I'm running faster than my pain I wish I could breathe out this fear, this doubt Send it into the Milky Way I got my finger on the trigger of a Magnum 44 But survival instinct won't let me bleed I wanna put a bullet straight in my cerebral tissues place But my index finger won't let me squeeze I wanna skate down my vein with the blade Till the blood runs thicker than the thoughts in my head But don't ask me why this is not my goodbye It's a suicide failure attempt I choose life, I choose life, I choose living Put the bottles and the pills down I stand up, I breathe with precision Calm washes over me like a break in the storm I close my eyes for a minute Then my troubles transform And I travel deep into the corners of my mind I remember the first time I felt hopeless I think I was five Cause at the hands of this bully The lessons that I learned Is that this world is not so beautiful Sometimes it can be burnt by the fires of evil That are living inside The common people, common people Just like you and like I we all strive to survive and we all climb to the top Over our brothers and sisters whether we mean to or not And we get lost in the tide of insecurities and power seeking fooleries But happiness don't live inside no jewelries In an age of distraction we would rather tap on our iPhones Than stop a war from happening It's heartbreaking Satan's patiently waiting for us to mess up big time So hell on earth will be blatant So forgive me for wanting to blow my brains out But I've got a change of heart It's time for change now, rearrange now, fist in the sky I say proud, say loud, revolution word on my brain now Get with the people, yeah powers with the people If the people strive for unity, the world it could be equal You could be the start of the start of the beginning A dawn of no stress, no troubles, no sinning, just living So overthrow evil and greed, put aside your distractions Welcome change with me, welcome change with me Welcome change with me, welcome change, welcome change he really is well and i love even yes. though it's like so sad he's like super resilient you know what i mean yes. like he exudes hope and happiness even though i know that's not what he was feeling you know right. like he yeah. wanted it right and i mean he i mean he talks about it a lot how he wanted to end it all but like yeah i'm so glad he did oh god me too like the world would have lost we a treasure Ren. for sure yeah we need Ren. yeah that's for sure
Oh, man. He's such a beautiful human being. He really, really is. So, excuse me, I've been up all day. Me, the, uh, to be honest, number one was still harder for me. Yeah. And I don't yeah. know if that's because we revisited everything with Joe. Um, yeah. So that particular part of it was harder. What was tough about this one is how deep his story went on all, like how deep he was right. on his level of explaining everything, you know, and what he actually went through, um, which uh, at times was really hard to hear. But I definitely think like the story of Joe just hits me like a ton of bricks. And I don't know if that's because like, I've le like literally lost my best friend um not to suicide but i i i lost my best friend she died two years ago um it was two years in april and so i don't know if that's why it hits differently or just because i've had a lot of death i don't really know but like yeah, yeah. joe's story just it, it rips my heart out so yeah, but, yeah. Too, like, all too. right well uh i definitely had more tears during the first one than i did thank you time. ryan I think What's up, Brian? Like, I think it's like you because I've had so many personal deaths, you know, like that really meant the world to me. Mm -hmm. That died, you know, and yeah. I guess that's that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, I just admire, uh, I, you know, Ren gives me hope for myself. Like if he can go through what he went through and survive and come out on the other side, then I can definitely go through what I'm going through right. and come out on the other side. I you know what I mean? Like, I think that's where. Yeah, like, Peter, I, I agree. I think that's everybody. I think, I mean, that's what I love about his storytelling. And anyone who is feeling the way, you know, these feelings, I would totally be like, go listen to Ren. You know, here, this is the song mm -hmm. you need to go check out because he, he definitely has that ability to help you get through whatever it is in life you're going through. Like Cosmic was saying earlier about. And uh, John and Peter were saying that, that Ren could be her angel. Like, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Man. Thanks for watching, guys. Make sure you hit that like, comment, subscribe, tap that bell so that way you get notified anytime the baddies drop. Peace out.